Uh, this is Larry Rieger. Uh, I want to uh, welcome everybody on behalf of Heritage Preservation and the American Association of State and Local History. Our, our organizations have had the privilege of working closely with IMLS on its very successful Connecting to Collections initiative, and this webinar is uh, part of that series. Um, I'm confident that you will take away valuable lessons from the speakers of this web for this webinar. I had the pleasure of learning from Ann Edgar about how to get members of the press and other media interested in a story at two Connecting to Collections Raising the Bar workshops this summer. Judith Dobrinsky is one of the foremost reporters and commentators on culture. I know that you will find her insights into the workings of the press to be invaluable. Speaking of you, this leads me to ask you to participate so that we can learn more about you by completing the first two polls, which you will see on your computer screen. First, uh, what part of the country are you joining us from? Great, we're getting all kinds of responses. And the second is, what kind of institution are you affiliated with? Okay. Now, is a very long poll, so let's make sure that you can see all of this because we have lots of different kinds of. Uh, let me try to resize this here. Moment, I'll slide this over here. Can you see all of that on your screens? Right, go ahead, Larry. OK. Uh, actually, now I'm pleased to introduce Marcia Simmel, who is acting director of IMLS. Marcia is also deputy director for museums and director for strategic partnerships. And she will give you a brief overview of IMLS's multifaceted Connecting to Collections initiative. As I turn the program over to Marcia and become a participant in this webinar, I have one last poll question for you. Are you watching this webinar by yourself or with others? Okay, Thank you. Let's, let's um, because I, I see that answers are still coming in on some of the other polls. I'm going to slide this off. I want to give people a chance to answer. Yeah, and this is Marsha. Uh, Susan, I'll let you uh, move move things around here for us. I will. Just let's give us. Let's give the audience a second to answer this last poll. Sure. While people are answering, I just want to welcome you all. We are so thrilled and pleased uh, that we are continuing our Connecting to Collections work through a webinars like this one. I want to start by thanking our wonderful partners at Heritage Preservation and at the American Association for State and Local History. You are. Um, we, we've had a wonderful relationship um, with our two partner organizations, and we could not have done this with without them. Uh, so I'll just briefly uh, remind everybody that the Institute of Museum and Library Services is a federal agency, and we have three main goals in our work: sustaining culture, heritage, and knowledge. Uh, enhancing learning and spurring innovation, and supporting professional training so that the staff of libraries and museums can be leaders in their communities. And I'm not seeing anything on my screen right now. Here we go. Is this what you're looking for? I've taken the polls away. OK. We're all, you know, this is election season, so these polls are really interesting to us, of course. <laughs> so, but I can, I can talk without the slides, too. Basically, Connecting to Collections was a national priority initiative of the Institute of Museum and Library Services uh, that was inspired by the Heritage Health Index, which revealed startling uh, needs in libraries, museums, and archives around preservation and conservation of our incredibly valuable and enormously rich collections. Uh, it's been a multi-part initiative that's included a national summit, four national forums, an international convening, 57 statewide planning grants, almost 3,000 bookshelves, conservation bookshelves, and 
I suspect that many of you who are participating this morning have been part of the initiative one way or another. We want you to stay part of this family. This is a, an initiative that is extraordinarily important in building um, a, a kind of collective sense of solidarity, a learning community, uh, a community that's educating not only ourselves, but people within and across the nation around the value of our collections, uh, their real needs in taking care of the collections, changing definitions and practice and stewardship. So with that, I just want to say that I'm thrilled that there's been such a wonderful response so far. And we, uh, I, and I'm grateful here to my colleagues, especially Nancy Rogers and Abby Sweats, too, who are, are really taking this forward. Thanks so much. And I guess now I would like to introduce uh, two, our two experts who will be taking you the rest of the way. Anne Edgar, the principal of uh, Anne Edgar Associates in New York, who's done so much work, as Larry has said, in our, our Raising the Bar webinars. And she's worked with institutions all across the country around uh, publicizing and spreading the word and really building public awareness and communications around the role of museums. And Judith Drabrinsky, an award-winning journalist based in New York, who has written so uh, passionately and competently and persuasively about the relationship between arts and business. So Anne and Judith, thank you so much for being part of this. And I'll turn this over to you. Well, this is Anne speaking. And I'm really glad to be here. I'm taking one moment to start my stopwatch, because I don't want to go on too long. I will be jumping in right now, though, with, with, with little ado. One thing I would like to ask is, what do you guys think? How is press coverage different from an advertisement? If I could have some stabs or some answers, and I know this is 101, but let's, let's see if we can get some answers right away on that, and we'll figure out what we're talking about today. And I opened up a, a separate chat box here that you can put your answers immediately into. I see Linda and Diana and Vicki have figured this out, so that you can answer in the center. Boy, I'm seeing great answers, too, great answers. Um, and it's really about what we're here today talking about. We're talking today just about, at least I'm talking today, just about publicity and media relations. Uh, yes, indeed, media relations cannot be paid for. It's not an advertisement. Uh, it does carry more credibility because an independent news outlet trusts you enough and believes in your story enough to tell it for you or to tell it or to report uh, to their readers, viewers, or listeners. So today we're talking about ways that you can convince newspapers, magazines, radio, television, and online outlets that some part of your collection is newsworthy enough for their users. And they'll cover you for free. You can't control it. Um, the media isn't there to serve you, but the media is your friend, and that's a little bit of what we'll be talking about today. I hope everyone, can everyone see these uh, answers? Because it's all great. It involves uncertainty. Yes, media relations cannot be controlled. Um, we wouldn't want it to. It often reaches a broader audience. It's picked up, particularly in the days of uh, social media. So I'm just going to hope that everyone is reading these uh, answers that are really so good. So I just want to take a moment to say that there's not enough time today to talk about everything in the degree I would like to. This is the best resource I know for this subject, $24, best investment you can make. I have no stake in it, I must say. Um, now, I'd like to know a little bit more about you as we talk about uh, doing publicity for your collections today. Oh, good. I see it coming in. One thing I'm seeing is that, for the most part, we are not trained communicators, which is Fine. That's what we're talking about today, the ability that it really works using your common sense and your sense of what's newsworthy in your collection. So this is it's great that it's coming in. And Anne, I should interject here sure. that they can select more than one role, I believe. Absolutely, because I have a feeling that a lot of you guys are multitasking. <laughs> I don't. I'm lucky enough to do this all the time and nothing else, but that has its own insanity too. So. And, and the name of that book was what again? 
I'll put let that me, tab. Yeah, let me go back. Well, in fact, let me publicity grab it. for nonprofits. Yeah, let me grab it from the bookshelf. It's publicity for nonprofits. It's by a professional. It's by a woman named Sandra Beckwith. It's really, you guys, written for uh, social organizations, uh, nonprofits along the spectrum, but it's still the best, and I think you'll find it helpful, too. Okay. Um, wow. This is great. What we're going to be talking about today is how to bring media visibility to your collection without being a trained publicist. You don't need to be. And it's about how to do that in intelligently and effectively. I'd also like to, a bit of questions at the beginning, and then um, I won't front load so much. But if I could also ask you what percentage of your time you are now spending on publicity outreach each week. Yep, yep, OK. One thing I wanted to say to you guys today is we're going to be talking about how you can do effective publicity work with few resources and a, you know, not a great amount of time. I wanted to assure you, though, that I'm not talking to you today about mini PR or a different set of criteria than I use. Today we're talking about the most intelligent and best way to reach the media. And most of the thinking that I'm sharing with you today is thinking about how I work as someone who's been doing this work for more than 20 years and works for museums around the country. So 71 of us at the moment devote less than 10% of their time to publicity work. Now, I want to take just a moment to kind of Let's start at the very beginning, which is what makes something newsworthy? You know, I see that there are people here from Mount Vernon, from Tennessee, from Memphis, from Kingsport, from Albany, all around the country and Canada. And, I, oh, wonderful. Thank you so much. Um, yep, yep. Wonderful, wonderful, wonderful. It's, you're saying all the things we're going to talk about. I will try to, therefore, perhaps go a little more quickly through this part. But... I took a stab. You know, something is newsworthy when it's unusual, when it doesn't happen very often. Um, Susan, I'm trying to see my, oh good, thank you. Um, something is newsworthy when it's a first. Um, and of course, this isn't, this, Susan, this is not quite clicking for me. Is Oh, that's because I'm not using the button correctly. I'm sorry. <laughs> Uh, I'm sorry. You guys, I only know how to use one button, and I'm not even doing well at that. But something is newsworthy often when it's a first, when it's never been seen before, when it's rare, uh, when it's old, unbelievably old. Perhaps you guys remember about a year ago there was a story about the, the world's oldest shoe, a prehistoric shoe that was found in Armenia. Well, you know, that's news. And of course, expensive, very expensive. You'll remember, many of you who are my age will remember a decade ago when the Smithsonian was celebrating its bicentennial. I believe it was its Hope Diamond that was one of the centerpieces of that exhibition, in part because of the beauty, but in part because of the vast value. We'll also be talking today about how to find stories in your collection. And that's often human interest, because you know we know we're just fancy primates, right? And we are curious about each other. So you look at objects and try to, you know, it's about who owned that decades ago, a century ago, centuries ago. Who made that object? Perhaps who found or saved it? And of course, who conserved it? Who made a heroic effort to conserve it? And of course, that might be you. That might be your museum or gallery. In a sense, because you don't have much time and you don't have much resources, I really urge you to practice a kind of triage, to look at your collections, if you can, in a disinterested way. If everyone will just glance at this headline, the Museum of Motorcycle History receives its first brown motorcycle. Thank you. Thank you. It's not, why is that not newsworthy? Because while it might be important to you institutionally, it might be an institutional milestone for you that you now have your first brown motorcycle. It doesn't necessarily mean that it's of interest to the world. So as you play, you, you 
do a kind of triage of your collection, ask yourself, is this just important to me because it's a milestone internally, because it's a collection I've waited the longest for, it's the first time perhaps we've had a permanent exhibition? If you answer yes to that and you can't find a way to link it to the outside world, I'd question whether that's the best story for you to devote and to sink your time and resources to. And of course, this begins to be newsworthy. Now, we carry a burden as cultural publicists because we are often telling stories that, and by the way, you guys, through this presentation, I'm trying to use journalistic terms like evergreen, like newspeg, because it's the kind of thing that we need to become familiar with, and you will know many of them anyway, because they've kind of many of them have entered the, the culture. But you know, our news can be ignored sometimes. Because stories about our collection can be told this week, next week, or even a year from now. So it's up to us to find some way to make it where we tap into the public consciousness, connect to the community, as someone said earlier uh, in, in, in their response. They said it you know, just perfectly. So it's finding a way to connect with what your community is caring about that moment. You know, I'm sure you've noticed that most every February at Valentine's Day, it's not unusual to see uh, museum exhibitions. I remember the Met about a decade ago had a wonderful exhibition of medieval books that were shaped like hearts. And of course, that exhibition was on view during, you know, and on Valentine's Day. So, you know, if you have a selection of poems handwritten by Walt Whitman, do, you know, don't Whatever you do, issue a press release about the interest, you know, about how interesting that is, and issue it two days before Christmas. You'll get nowhere. Think of Walt Whitman's birthday, which I think is, oh lordy, I actually even knew it might be June third or something. But send um, news release out on Walt Whitman's birthday. Now, another way to create a news peg is to collaborate with other collections in your region, other institutions in your region, or even sometimes profit organizations. But it's a way of making your story bigger. And going back to the Walt Whitman example, so you have a really interesting collection of poems, drafts, handwritten by Walt Whitman. But you know that two towns over, a historical society has some amazing photographs taken in the last years of his life, and even one of the early Edison sound uh, cartridges. Consider collaborating with that historical organization and even making that consortium larger. Maybe we're thinking about a Walt Whitman festival that, again, is time to his birth or death. It's about trying to collaborate to make a story so large that the press can't ignore it and wouldn't want to. Along those same lines, think about piggybacking. Say you are a museum 30, 50 so miles away from Winterture, and Winterture is mounting an exhibition of precious porcelain statuettes of a certain period. Well, say that you have American stoneware statuettes from that same period. Pull those out. Make an exhibition of them. It can be a small exhibition. But open your exhibition at the same time as Winterture. You're not hurting them. You're helping them. And it certainly offers you an opportunity to, quote, unquote, piggyback on the Winterture exhibition. And again, I would just say in a larger kind of way, the more you can exhibit works from your collection, the more you can bring people into your museum and gallery, the more opportunities you'll have for media coverage. Now, I want to pause for a moment just to say that one of my jobs as a museum publicist is really trying to figure out how not only to tell stories on the cultural pages, but how to get stories in, say, the real estate, real estate section, um, the science section, perhaps, um, and of course, the travel section. And I wanted to say to you today that travel sections and travel editors may be your most underused resource right now. Um, I can tell you that the travel editors of the major papers throughout the country, whether it be the LA Times, Sacramento Bee, 
uh, the Omaha paper, the Fort Worth Star-Telegram. I can tell you right now that those travel editors are really eager to hear about daytime trips throughout the country to kind of package those and share them with their readers or make it easy for them. Think about the right season of the year. Again, we're thinking seasonally. I don't know if it's cher you know, cherry blossom time for you or if your big season might be in August, but think about when you might suggest a daytime trip to Saratoga or a daytime trip to Atlanta that will include, of course, your museum or library. You know, I mentioned the importance of exhibitions, if it's possible. I know some of you can only mount very small exhibitions, some none at all. But when you do have an exhibition, it's so important to try to use it and, in a way, squeeze every little bit of notice you can out of it. One way of doing that, and I was talking to my colleague Nancy Revenel, who's going to be talking later this afternoon, who's at Shelburne up in Vermont, and she was telling me how smart the publicists at Shelburne are. Because what they'll do typically is when they have a major exhibition, they'll invite journalists from you know, the Vermont area into the museum for a behind-the-scenes look at the preparing for that collection that's coming up. They show works in the process of being excuse me, conserved. Um, you know, otherwise, uh, they give a walkthrough of uh, collection storage. But it's all about showing the jour journalists how they prepare for a an exhibition. And what does that get you? Goodwill. But more importantly, it can get you an advanced story, the kind of story that runs a month before an exhibition or a month and a half that will kind of create a drum roll or a buzz about the show and give people time to prepare to travel to it. Now, I use the word drum roll. I don't know how many of you, how many of you saw this um, article? It was in the Times just on Tuesday. Today's Thursday. It was in the Science Times, top of the fold. And it was all about an exhibition that has opened, I believe, this week or perhaps last week at the Whitney. And it's an example of thinking outside the box and not just thinking that we always have to go to entertainment or arts editors. The publicists at the Whitney saw a story in the difficulties of conserving the work of this modern artist, Paul Tech, who you guys apparently use as completely gross material from, I think I even mentioned ground beef, but was it hair? I mean, you know, really icky, icky organic material. But that's the whole story, is how do you conserve objects like that? And it's an example of the Times going outside the art section and making a science story. And one point that I'm obviously making that's kind of, you know, the subtext of all the talk today is that cultural coverage rarely just happens. You can bet that the Whitney was planning to go to the Science Times weeks before they did. They, and they knew that it was part of their strategy and plan that they would do that. And just one more thing to say about how to ruffle up coverage in advance of an exhibition. You know, if you're mounting either a temporary or a personal exhibition and you are hoisting something into your gallery with a crane, all I can say to you is think photo op, photo op, photo op. You've got an opportunity for a great picture, uh, an interesting picture like this one. Now, for those of you who are freaking out at this moment and thinking, oh my God, she's talking so fast and I don't know how to go to a photo editor, I would just say Sandra Beckwith in her book on publicity has a really great section on how to go to the photo editor and what you need to do for a photo op. Just a little bit more before I get off the subject of how to make a news peg, how to create a story that has to be told now. Because if you don't have a story that's needs to be told now, your story is going to languish and it's never going to run. So again, say you have the best collection of baseball ephemera in the country, maybe 19th century stuff. You know, maybe if you're in St. Louis Historical Society, you've got great stuff, you know, early modern, staying mutual. Again, don't release a press release on that in December. 
when are we as a culture, as Americans, thinking baseball? Well, we're thinking baseball when the season opens. I think that's April. God knows I could be wrong, but I think it's April. Uh, we, maybe it's more about when the little league seasons opens in your town. I think it's, you know, some, some towns of in Pennsylvania, I know you're crazy about little league. So maybe that's the news peg, or maybe it's the World Series. But that's the moment to send out a release with fabulous photographs on your important collection. Now, it would be easier if I could tell you that there was one time, one moment when you needed to call your newspaper, a magazine like the Smithsonian, television, and radio. But unfortunately, things are a little bit more complicated than that. And while I'm, I, you guys, I know this slide looks like it's a diagram of nuclear fusion. So please, what I'm talking about is not that complicated. But it is true that we need to call magazines like the Smithsonian almost six months earlier than we hope a story will appear. So if you're thinking you would like the story of your baseball collections to appear with the opening day of the baseball season, I would recommend to you that you call Smithsonian or Sports Illustrated, wherever you think likely, a good six months in advance. Now, I'm not going to go into timing more. I've put lead times here, and you'll have the use of this PowerPoint. I just want to assure you, you know, don't freak out. It's not that hard. If you're afraid that you're overwhelmed by the sense of when to call, I would just say if you're going to err, err on calling earlier rather than later. Now, oh, good, good, good. I'm seeing wonderful. And, Ann, I put up a little a side question here. If somebody uh -huh. other, if they could um, list their sources there. In That's that great. List. I really appreciate it, Susan. Now, oh, good. Yep, you get to know people personally. It's wonderful that you're using Twitter. That's something that I need. This is all the way it's done. Thank you so much. Um, Vivian Solek and Monroe, you are doing it just the way I do it and the way it should be done. Again, as someone who's been doing nothing else for 20 years, you would think, you know, I right now do my work on behalf of museums around the country primarily by reading, 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 and keeping up with bylines. You know, obviously I know people at this point, but the, the world of cultural journalism is being so roiled by layoffs, et cetera, et cetera, that we don't. I can't even keep up with the changes. So as a group, today we're really, by reading bylines, it's the safest way to do it and the best. And of course, it's not the only way. I'm looking to see some of these other answers here. Compiling from mastheads, yes, yes. Small town, you see them in the grocery store. I'm sure they run from you, but yes, that's fabulous. Um, it's um, I'm glad you're not using now antique mailing lists. It's worse than doing nothing in some ways. OK. I'm going to try to move on here. I really appreciate these submissions. So uh, let me see. Again, thank you for those who said social media. Now, there are probably those among you who feel like, I don't have the resources or knowledge to do any PR. I probably need a list of 500 names, and I need a professional list. I don't have it. Well, all I would say to you is no. When I begin a media campaign for a major project, I sit down and create a press plan, which is nothing more than a list of likely prospects, the places where I think this story should be told. And frankly, that list could be as few as 10 names, or as many as, you know, 50. But for you, I would say, think of your wish list. Do you really see this on CBS Sunday? Then put it down. Do you really see this in the New York Times? Because you've seen other things that's no, that are no more interesting but similar. Then I say, yes, put that on your list. But don't feel that you need to have a massive commercial list. Um, you know, and as you think of who you might contact, consider the medium. I hope that you have fabulous images, because that really drives the story these days. And if you do, think print. Um, 
if you if you have a curator or or your director is really fabulously interesting, great interview. Think for radio as well. It doesn't mean you won't go to print too, of course. But try to think of what you know your strengths are, the strengths of the stories are. If I can leave you with one thought today is do not depend on email blasts to get your idea across. It will not work. Do not even worry if you don't have a news release or a fancy press kit. The most important tool, or should I say weapon, but I'll say tool, the most important tool you have is the telephone, a follow-up email, and the willingness to contact a journalist one-on-one. Now, I'll tell you how I do it. I contact the most important outlets first. That doesn't mean the most important outlets outlets in the world. It means the most important outlets to you at this moment for this story. And that might be the local Saratoga, you know, shopkeeper more than the New York Times. That's fine. But I call my most important people first. Who knows, I might get hit by a bus. I want to do the most important first. Although I also, of course go to the longest lead time at the same time, kind of simultaneously, because I need to. By the way, I'm loving what I'm seeing people say, I hope, and I'm sure everybody's reading them. I love it that people call the news outlets and ask for updates. They appreciate, I'm you know, quoting Billy uh, Chabot in Auburn, they appreciate not being bombarded by the wrong person. It's all so true. Now, one thing I'd like to say to you is, if you, you know, it's, it's make freelance journalists in your area your friend because they work for a living placing stories and therefore they do it better than you. They know how to do it better than you and they're avid to find stories to make a living. So you make the, any freelance journalist you know of in your community your friend. Uh, sometimes I use the white pages to find a, a freelance journalist when I've seen a byline. You know, call them at home and, and a you know, apologize on the front end and say, I'm calling from the so-and-so library. Please, if, uh, if I'm calling improperly at home, let me know. But I did want to tell you that something coming up. You know, if you preface it like that, I can just about promise you'll be received with respect. Call in the mornings because people tend to close in the afternoon. Make sure that they know that you're a museum or library because you are there serving the public, and people understand that. Let them know right away the timing involved. Okay, I'm checking right this moment my stopwatch to make sure. Okay, I'm going to... I believe that a lot of you guys can read this, and some of these tips are really important. Always go directly to someone. Never use general mailboxes. It just won't help you. The more personal you can make the contact, the better. And one reason is because the journalists don't want a story that they think is being shopped around everywhere. And by sending around a personal note, you're communicating that you want them to notice the story, that this is not something you're sending to every John, Dick, and Harry, or whatever that Dick and Harry is. Embed, don't attach news releases. Don't over-design. Don't think that other means because you're small, maybe you're a small library, don't think that the big guys are creating beautiful design press releases and you want, aren't. It actually works against you to over-design a press release because it begins to look like a promotional object. All you have is the subject line. You know, one other reason it's great to write a personal note to the press is that you can say things that you can't say in a press release. Like maybe in a press release you don't want to say that one of the objects in your collections went for a quarter of a million at auction. Well, you can embed the release, and in a personal note you can say that, and it'll pique the interest of the journalist, and you won't be saying something inappropriate in a press release. You know, when I first began working 23 years ago or so, all Always when I sent an envelope, I wanted to prove how professional I was by having it look perfect. That's not what I want to prove now. Now when I send an envelope, I write on hand so that the journalist will know that a, there's a person behind the message. I also try to send things by hand or by FedEx. Mainstream national publications often don't open the U.S. mail. Sorry, not much to say here, but I'm hoping that you'll take, take advantage of every free opportunity. 
nothing is more important than good photography, except maybe your children. Now, I'm going to leave you with hopefully what you'll feel like are two gifts. Right here is the, um, oh, it's not so hard, Jamie. I know you're seeing it, but it's not so hard. If you choose three people to go to and do it right, you'll do better than doing 24, 100 names. So this can be done. Um, this is the um, email address for finding your local AP representative. And I'm also right here leaving you with the email address and the phone number of the new National Bureau Chief of the Times, whose job is to ferret out cultural stories around the country. It's not Arthur Salzberg or the, edit, the publisher of the Times. You may be familiar with the name. I think this is his son, so it's someone who's there as a reporter to be interested with, in you. So anyway, that's it for the formal presentation, and I uh, thank you so much. Thanks. Susan, you want to take over? Yeah, well, right. I'm, I think at this point we're going to have a conversation with you and Judith and some of the questions. And I did want to bring up this slide again because there was great curiosity in the beginning about great, great. particular um, publication so the audience can get the information they need there. Um, I am going to actually start from the some of what I read right at the end, questions about Someone works at a museum where they're not allowed to talk about the value of a collection. Yeah, I was just saying that. That's Teresa Harley Wilson. Thank you. And Teresa, that's exactly why you don't put it in a news release. I would only send that information to it. You know, you don't broadcast that to a hundred, you know, a hundred or five hundred or a thousand journalists. But if there's someone you know and it's a contact, yes, in an email you can say. By the by, it's not for public record, but, or you could say, by the way, by and by, it is in the public record that this has fetched so and so on auction. So, yes, you have to be careful on how you do it, but that's the beauty of talking to a press um, just one on one and not um, trying to do a lot of things at once, talking to a lot of people at once. And um, and the emphasis is also on the story behind and how you're caring for that collection, right? Yes. That's a real opportunity, I think, for most everybody here today. Um, I think the public has been, I mean, I think there are polls that tell us this, that the public has been proven to be really interested in the backstory of how collections are cared for, how they're stored. Uh, sometimes that can be, mean placing a story in the home section of your paper, and it becomes a how-to story, like how do you care for linens or how do you care for uh, antique woolens. Um, but I think that's always a kind of how-to, behind-the-scenes story. Mm -hmm. Judith, do you want to add your insights onto this? Yeah, I, I, um, I agree with almost everything Ann said, although I will say this, and that is that you know, Ann gave you a lot of suggestions that may or may not apply to everyone. For example, not every journalist wants to have a phone call before an email. So you know, you have to get to know the, the people, if you can, um, and uh, somebody may prefer an email first, for example, and then set up a, a call. But basically what she said was really strong information. Um, I want to add one other thing. Freelancers in particular, but lots of other you know, reporters as well, and I've been both, um, are often seeking stories and um, not necessarily during your business hours or can't reach uh, you. One thing I'm uh, I'm completely surprised by when I when I'm doing that on my own is that um, many websites don't don't have press information on their on their online. Um, there's no name. There's no number. There might be a you know press at so and so museum dot org, which you know, may yield a, a response five days later, if any at all. If your organization doesn't have a press name, contact number, link with past um, press releases and, and images, um, that's some place where you can start because people like me are also on looking, you know, t taking our own initiative to look for stories as well. That's just the start. <laughs> Great. And I'm going to ask you to navigate to, I got a, a request for seeing the slide with all the information we need to make clear to the media contacts we're trying to make. Okay. But meanwhile, um, 
Judith, could you tell us a little bit about how do you find a freelance person? You know, if you're looking for a freelance journalist. I think it it's the same way you find a staff person. You notice their bylines. Yeah, I would say that too. Okay. Curiosity about that. Um, and, and again, I would say don't be afraid to use the most commonsensical methods. If you um, if it's a byline in your local paper, well, they're probably using the white pages is going to be effective. That's so, absolutely right. I'm, yeah. I'm completely surprised sometimes when, when people say, I've tried to find you, I've tried to find you. I mean, the white pages, you know. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> so, and you can easily find my, I mean, on my blog, is, there's an email. So it's, it's uh, I think that it's easier than people think sometimes. Right. Uh with respect to what's newsworthy, I'm going back to that. How do you um, how do you create value for things that you see as newsworthy, but perhaps there's some question there? Maybe it's um, it's newsworthy to a donor who. Oh, that's a, I was thinking about that earlier before this presentation, and that's always can be true. You know, you've just received a donation of um, you know. Uh, maybe correspondence from World War II, and maybe it's not particularly all that newsworthy because there's similar things in similar archives. How do you create value? You know, if something is not really newsworthy, I, I, I think you can just do the best you can, and Judith may want to weigh in, but I think you can stand on your head and maybe not succeed. But basically, you can create value by doing the things that we've been talking about today. It takes a lot of research, but really researching the objects and finding any thread of, 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 uh, of interesting anecdotes. Uh, you know, finding why does this collection matter? And frankly, if after your research you haven't come up with an answer to that, it's probably something you're just going to have to send a press release out about to satisfy the donor, but you may not be able to get the, the media coverage uh, to the degree you wish. Let me throw one th other idea in, and that uh -huh. is to link it to something that's yes. really important going on today. If you have something that links to an election in the past that was interesting and might you know, link to this election today, or if you have something that relates to the financial crisis, uh, it, it, you might be able to somehow uh, use that letter, use that book, use that something in your collection to link to something that the general public is focused on today. Erin uh, O'Malley also said she's had uh, great luck targeting a specific group, like a labor exhibit to labor groups in the area. Fabulous. Yeah, yeah. Erin, um, do you call, I, I guess, um, do you call the Fort Worth uh, Star Telegram first before you put it on the Internet? And um, I'll be interested to see if you do that. So. Uh, that's what I often do. I often call the major paper first and try to get an article there, and then I put the press release uh, out in the world. So That's because so often it will mean more to your local paper to get the story first. And there's quite a bit of chatter going on in the, in the chat area about the issue of attachments, who will open them and who won't. It's kind yes. Of interesting. There's Let me a lot. weigh in on that because I'm, sure. I'm the recipient here. I mean, I totally agree with um, with the idea that uh, maybe it's particularly freelancers. I don't know, but we're not going to open attachments, and it's not necessarily the safety. Some of that is we don't know you, we we don't recognize the email address, but also it's the time. I got a press release the other day, which I was completely had four attachments to it. Four attachments, all all word, all different different items, and a very short paragraph explaining what was in each one, uh, not not in each one really, what the overall theme was, and there was no way there wasn't enough in in the first paragraph to um, interest me to open four attachments to find out what the story was going to be. I think most of it, or enough that that um, is going to intrigue. The um, recipient's interest has to be in the main body of the of the email. And again, so much of what we're talking about today is making it easy for that journalist to absorb your message. Don't make it hard for them. And by attaching, you're making it hard for them. Absolutely. Should I jump in and address Rose Daly's question? 
Yeah, go right ahead. Thank you. Uh, Rose, I see you've asked, I think you've asked a really good question. How do you appeal to the general public while maintaining a certain academic integrity? Now, let me, I hope I can say this right without wandering, but I remember reading somewhere once that kids for a while were reading less well because their primers were being so dumbed down that they weren't as interesting. And here is a moment to say, sometimes when you really grasp a project, including, I mean, that, you know, how, well, how do you know that something's academic? It's really about why it matters. And if that involves some uh, detailed academic stuff, don't, don't undersell your audience. Any bit of information um, that makes a case for why something matters can be included. I will say it's so important to avoid jargon, avoid artistic jargon. For those of you who deal with the contemporary arts, just avoid that horrible jargon or scientific jargon. But so, you know, write in real English, but don't feel you have to dumb down the story. There's a question from Julie about, um, it, it was a longer question, but paraphrase, fear of bad review from the press. If you do put something out there, uh, is this the loss of control that you were talking about earlier? Um, yes. Um, you know, you can, as a museum or a library, you can take out a um, half-page ad in your newspaper, and you know exactly what that ad is going to say and look like. But you don't know how an exhibition is going to be reviewed or how one of your you know, major initiatives is going to be um, received by the press. But so I've been doing this for 20 years, as I keep saying. Sorry, I don't mean to repeat. But yet I'm still a bit of an idealist. I feel that I work in a fair world and a fair environment. I feel like that um, the press wants to report on newsworthy exhibitions and projects that benefit their readers or their listeners. So don't, I wouldn't be afraid of bad reviews. If, you know, if you're doing good work, you may receive middling reviews, but you have no choice, actually, do you, to go out into the world and just kind of um, have that kind of courage. And I think, actually, there's so many voices today that one bad review isn't really going to be all that important, e even if it is in the most important outlet in your, in your hometown or a national outlet. Uh, I, I rarely see reviews that are you know, killers, the way somebody used to kill a Broadway show. Um, so I would take the chance. There are many voices. Do you get heard if you're a paid advertiser more than just sending in well, I've worked at three or four um, publications um, as a staff person and um, many as a freelancer. I have never seen that access. Maybe they hide it from me and the rest of the journalists, but I, I've, I've never seen that you know an ad will do uh, will guarantee good coverage or more coverage or um, anything like that. Okay. And I really would like to, from from my vantage point, say the same things. Uh, you know, again, working for museums that are very large and working for museums that are small, um, you know, purchasing an ad will not um, at all encourage more coverage. Uh, and less small, maybe tourist publications or very small um, local papers where it's a mom and pop thing. But if you're thinking about mainstream national outlets don't work in a way it's good for you because most of the people here today represent many of you represent smaller organizations and if you've got a good story idea that should make you feel good because you've got just as good a shot at it as someone say from the Guggenheim or the MoMA with a very big uh, advertising budget. Mm -hmm. Let's uh, address Amy Sanderson's question because I, th I think it wraps up a, a lot of things. Can you see that there Anne? Yeah I can right. Um, I, I, I think Amy it, it's a, it's I don't think it's an either-or situation, I th and I think that um, actually piggybacking on might get coverage that you wouldn't ordinarily get in any case. And then I have a second comment on it, which is advancing your museum's mission. And that is, you know, anytime you deal with journalists, it's it's really uh, the best 
encounter, the, the best uh, relationship is when it's a two-way street and that um, something that has impact for you also has impact for the journalist um, who will come back to you and, and begin to build a, a trust relationship with you. And I just reposted Amy's uh, question there for people to uh, mm -hmm. refresh. She was asking about p piggybacking. Oh, sorry. Yes. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I should have repeated it. Yes. Uh, mm -hmm. There's a lot to process here. Yeah, yeah. right. I'm, I'm looking at some of the questions. and. Um, uh, you want to take one? or? Um, I do. There's just... Uh, well, let me... Oh, oh. I'm, I, I see that there are a number of people who are rightly pushing back at me about what I said with um, about an email note. You know, um, so much of this is about using judgment. So I guess um, when I w when I embed a news release and say something in that news release that I in, in a note that I would not say in the release, yeah, I'm really careful. Because once you send something out in a personal message in an email, it is out in the world with that journalist. So um, I often find there are things I can say that advance the story. And sometimes it's not. I mean, this is not about releasing secret information. I would never recommend that you do that. Sometimes it's as simple as, you know, there you have your news release, and it's embedded in the release. And maybe it's as simple as writing a note that says, uh, dear, Ariel, just want you to know that I've got great uh, B-roll footage. You know, you're not going to necessarily say in your news release that you have great B-roll footage. So it's in your note. It's advancing the story a little bit to that journalist. So please don't think that I'm suggesting that you can, without impunity, release information that's sensitive. There's a bit of a, a conversation about how you work with internal marketing departments and not stepping on toes. Um, and perhaps that's where a curator has an advantage of telling the story again. Yeah, I think the only advice I have is to try to work with them um, and, and make them understand that you can help them do their job. I think they're changing so much. Um, you know, it used to be that uh, press offices were the owners of information in a museum or library. You know, they uh, they were the only place that uh, the only voice that was heard, and they would decide that it that the director was the director who should comment on something or somebody else. But it's you know now we live in a world of social media where some of your curators are t are tweeting and some are you know on Facebook, and it's kind of an perhaps a, a good webinar would be on that subject because it's a challenge to communication and press office people. You know, you have to face the fact that the world is changing and um, work with your marketing colleagues. Uh, I know like a colleague of mine is the director of marketing at the Guggenheim and another colleague is the director of um, public relations at the Guggenheim, and they work together, obviously. I mean, when um, Betsy Ennis knows that there have been positive reviews on an exhibition, she makes sure that her marketing colleague knows that, and the museum tweets uh, excerpts from these positive reviews. So there's a, you know, these two uh, professionals, these two women are working together to get the word out using their different um, bailiwicks and expertise. I'm seeing that uh, from Aaron O'Malley that they're using social media as well. Um, you know, it's hard to overestimate to all of for all of us today to realize what a watershed period we've been going through in history. Because just to give you a, an example, I remember learning that through a, I think it was a Pew uh, poll, you know, very. Um, professionally done poll, that in 2005 there were something like 5,000 reporters in the country who identified themselves as arts reporters. And a year ago that had you know, gone down to 2,500. It had actually had. So um, we're working in a very different environment, and social media is what more and more the remaining press is using, too. Let's Questions are going so fast I can't... Uh, uh, Isolate one here. Is there yeah. anything you want to right. write now? Well, and it's not just it's just questions, but they're helping each other with it. They're that. helping. Yeah, I'm seeing that. Uh, let me see. 
this is the challenge as a presenter is um, not to get so sucked into what's happening on the side because it's fascinating, isn't it? It is fascinating. In fact, I wanted to say something about should all press releases, including blogs, like it's Kimberly Trickett from Orange, um, should all uh, press releases, including blogs, go through the communications department? You know what, Kimberly, even though the world is changing as rapidly as you know we're talking about, I would say yes. Uh, you have complete chaos otherwise. So yes, they should go through uh, your office. And I hate to say this as a reporter, but I think the answer is yes, too. I mean, obviously, we spend some part of our time trying to get around the press office in certain cases. But um, I still think the institution can't be conflicting with one another. That's, uh, that's confusing to everybody. I see that there's a question by Jean Goodman from Arthurdale. Um, you know, we also have a full-time staff of one. Okay. <laughs> do you have any advice for organizations that do not have a PR staff? You know, Jean, all I would say is, um, again, that word triage, you know, decide what is really urgent, what, what is really the urgent story to tell. Decide one or two places to go with it. Make sure that when you call someone, you're completely prepared and you understand why that project matters. But don't you're not going to have time to create news releases and do all that stuff. So it's about trying not to do everything, but not losing sight of what's really and truly newsworthy and the maybe two or three places that would be most likely to tell that story and most beneficial to your institution. Uh, let's take the Kim, Kim Kenny question there. What about tips for getting um, collections that aren't in exhibits? I think that goes back to some of what we were saying before, and let's elaborate. Um, finding an angle for it, finding it is, has it just been conserved? Is it related to some event right now? Has some but he comes through that you know made a made a big uh, fuss about it that it has a, a name that's recognizable in the community, or or maybe getting somebody that's with a name recognizable in the in the community to, to visit it, um, or uh, you know re relating it in some way. Let me give you an example that happened uh, just yesterday, and they did it last year as well. Um, the Nelson Atkins Museum uh, sent out a press release with a list and, I, and possibly the images as well, or making the images available online, um, of various paintings, works of art in its collection that are related and could be used to illustrate Christmas stories. Wow. I, they did that last year, I know, because I blogged about it last year. I thought uh -huh. it was a good idea. Uh -huh. And um, I don't think they'd do it again unless it had somehow worked. I thought that was a really good way to um, do what Kim just asked about. Uh, dying for you to answer the question from Haley Chambers, is there such a thing as too much press? Well, in my opinion as a publicist, you can probably guess what I'm going to say, but I would say the only time you might feel that you've oversaturated the local papers is if you are planning to launch a major project in the future that, and you fear that you've so saturated your local papers that that might be ignored. So, you know, it's about, if you can, and I know everybody's stressed, but it's looking ahead to the future and making decisions about what's really important to you. And if, frankly, your newspaper will pick up anything that you uh, release or any news that you disseminate, you might want to begin making decisions to be sure that your most important projects will be given the uh, prominence that they, they deserve. I agree. And I actually think there's a, a risk, too, of, of bombarding reporters, whether they're freelance or staff, with too much information, too many opportunities. Because at some point, um, they begin to, to not take you seriously. I actually think readers may be in that situation as well. Not all, but some. You know, again, talking about email, which is, you know, again, I think it's a, a tool that is so important now, but you don't want to be some institution that the minute a journalist sees your email moniker that you're just deleted right away. And that can happen if you're pelting that journalist with, with too much news. That's right. Too, too much information. Uh, there was a little flurry of conversation around Josh Williams' question concerning the decline of reading newspapers. Any thought on that? 
Well, we wish it would stop, but <laughs> I don't know how to get it to reverse. Um, I think for me it goes back to that um, issue that I mentioned earlier, which is that there isn't just one voice anymore. There are many voices, and sometimes getting information out to uh, a, a, a local website, uh, a blogger, um, the radio station, uh, the TV station, wherever you, you can think of, that's where people are getting their news. That's where you have to go. Right. And in fact, Judy asked about public radio, if you have any tips specific to them. Well, I almost have to laugh as I offer this tip because it comes in part from a, um, understanding failure, you know. Uh, I just, I, I find that, um, the only way I succeed uh, with having a story told on public radio is by going to the correspondent. And if I'm wrong about this, please, I know you'll jump in on the chat thing. But uh, I find that the uh, editors in Washington are perhaps too overwhelmed or, or for some other reason they maybe just prefer to work through their, their freelancers. So how do you find that person in your region? Again, um, if it's sometimes it's, you know, it's really often about using your uh, connections. I sometimes call my colleagues at larger, at the large institutions, museums here in New York, and I say, uh, dear, you know, so and so, would it be possible for me to ask you for the email of so and so? And people will typically share emails. They may not share personal numbers, but you know, generally, whether it be the white pages or asking friends, you can often find that uh, NPR correspondent. And, and just another thing on radio, period, and, and TV, period, which is um, if you've got sound for a radio story, you're in a, um, a, a lot better position than if hmm. you have just words. Right. And the same with TV. If, if you have some intriguing video or they can come and make some intriguing video, you've got a lot more chance of getting on the air. Uh, the, the saying in TV, uh, which I've been in a little bit myself is you know you write to the video no matter what the story is you write to the video and uh, radio reports without sound don't usually get as much time or even you know air, uh, opportunity as those with sound. I'd like to address Stephanie Miller just because I so sympathize. I mean, I really am not saying it's a piece of cake because. National journalists, how do you get through to national journalists when you're only uh, pitching them periodically? You know, you're not pitching them enough to become one of their, um, uh, someone they'll pick up the phone for. Uh, what I usually do, and I face that too, is I do try to find a personal email and an office number, um, maybe even, a, you know, again, a home office number. I do try to call them. But what do I do if they're not going to pick up my number because they don't know my name? And again, um, this is just what I do, but I often leave a message. I say, and I try to keep it short but really pithy. You know, I'll say, my name is Ann Edgar. I'm leaving a message about the largest uh, festival ever devoted to Walt Whitman, and I'm doing so on behalf of the um, Miller Museum. I'm going to be emailing you shortly. I know you get a lot of emails, so thank you for looking. And then I email it, you know, and then um, try to go from there. But, you know, again, I, it is a problem. Okay, we should probably address some of these uh, questions up here from uh, Angela Gaffney. What if there are only two newspapers in the region? Um, I, I, I'm not sure I'm exactly interpreting your question right, but I think, um, as I mentioned earlier, there are, are other alternatives, blogs, websites, um, other places that might give you publicity. Great. And how about Reginald's question? Yeah, uh, a really interesting one. Um, when you're in an area and two yeah. institutions are closely connected, that they're actually in competition. Well, you know, gee whiz, um, all you can try to do is to outsmart them and outfleet foot them. I mean, I know of so many museums' offices where they have a designated press officer, and they have an assist assistant, and they really have a budget for PR, but they're sluggish and they're leaden. If you, if you are really smart in what you identify as newsworthy, and you're really targeted into the, to the person you go to, you, know, you can all often make an effect that's 
really um, out of scale with, 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 with your budget that's beyond what one might think. I will say, Reginald, that what you really need is really strong visuals because whether it's press or television or even radio, because visuals can pique the interest of, you know, uh, help make a story fuller in someone's eye and head. So I, um, the smaller you are, the less I would skimp on uh, photography cost. I actually, um, I have a question, Reginald, if you could answer this question. So what is the outcome you're trying to to um, get? Are you trying to drive attendance to exhibitions, or are you just trying to raise the profile of the museum? Are you um, trying to, some, some press uh, departments are very key to the image of the person running the institution. Can you be a little bit more specific on what the, what the goal is that you're, uh, museum is after. He says increase visitation to our site. Okay, to your to your okay. So if it's about visitation, then I, I think I agree with everything that Anne said, and I also repeat: try other outlets. Just try what what aren't they doing? What area can you do some specialized um, PR, specialized marketing to to audiences that are not reading the daily paper or are not reading. Uh, watching TV, um, and you can reach them a different way if there's anything in that in your community. Erin opened up a discussion about YouTube and what kinds of videos are most successful. And well, this is interesting. I'm, I might just just by chance I was at a reception the other night where I met somebody who um, works with Google and um, is pretty high up at Google, and I asked him about the YouTube channels for um, museums, because I've been noticing that they're really not populated all that well. And he agreed from, you know, taking the, the cosmic view from on high, uh, YouTube gets lots of traffic, but it's it, not very many museums have had luck that he knew of or that I know of getting traction in your in their own, with their own channels. So I would say to you that it's a matter of your resources. If you have resources to spare and can put them into YouTube, there's you know nothing wrong with it. But if you're trying to spread resources um, thinly, I'd re-examine whether that's the channel you want to operate as your as your own channel. That isn't to say you can't put something special up there because you don't need a channel to put something on YouTube. I would like to mention as well that the afternoon's webinar will address YouTube uh, among other social media outlets. So I, I hope you guys can stay over for that. Nancy Revenal will be addressing it. And um, let's see what we got here. You know, I've talked a little bit about. Um, the importance of contacting journalists one-on-one -on -one anytime you can to make yourself real and to make your story real. Because the best things happen through a conversation. But uh, what do you do once you've sent, you've left a message perhaps on someone's voicemail, you know, a short message that you're sending news. You've sent the news release. You've embedded it. Maybe you've written a note so they know it's coming right to them. What do you do if you still don't get a journalist? You know, um, I... Go ahead, oh, Ann, but I want to comment no, you, again. No you, no, you jump in, Judy. Well, I, I would like to tell you that I'm able to answer every email, um, which is the way I get most of my um, most approaches from press people or PR people, um, unless they know me, like Ann, who might call me. Um, and I have to say I'd like to be able to answer all of them one cannot. It's the the number of emails that I get in a day, uh, and I'm not even at a, a newspaper. As I say, I'm a freelancer. Um, it's impossible to answer all of them, and many of them are totally unrelated. So I, I don't even think that the people sending them expect an answer. You know, and again, from the vantage point of a publicist, um, what I would do is perhaps call um, just. You probably will get a voice machine just to say that you've left the press release. Um, there's not a lot more you can do. No, if you're being ignored, I, do, I really think give it up. <laughs> you know, the idea is, oh, Amy, thank you. you. You're just keying into exactly what I was going to say. The important thing is to try to do it as well as possible right in the beginning of this process, which is, you know, um, make your subject line as um, 
I want to say catchy, but that's not the only thing, as catchy as possible. Uh, and Amy McDonald from uh, Yale is, is, is asking what makes a successful subject line. Judy will, will have her take. What I believe might be the case is I think it's important to have your institution's name because it separates you from the other pitches that that reporter might be getting from galleries or other for-profit for things. It gives you more weight in the community. But I also try to have the subject line be similar to a headline, like uh, the Yale, Gal Yale Gallery announces New Venture With. Of course, you also have to make sure it's not too long because it gets cut off. But, but I, I agree with exactly what you said. M get, make sure that it's people know, the recipient knows that it's coming from your institution somehow, and make it like a headline. Let's see. Getting lots of social media questions, but I think that yeah. will be better addressed this afternoon. Uh huh. Um, to Josh Williams in Washington, Arkansas, are there national outlets that are free? Josh, do you mean free for the reader to pick up? Uh, uh, do you mean, uh, or do you mean free uh, to have a story appear in them? If you're talking about the story, you know, again, today we're talking about how you um, achieve editorial coverage in a um, newspaper, a magazine, television, or radio. We're not talking about purchasing advertising. So everything we're talking about today can only be free. Right. Mm -hmm. Great, great point. Wow, we have, we have really gone through a lot of ground here, haven't we? Yes. <laughs> <laughs> this is exciting. I'm scrolling through to see if there are major themes that we perhaps haven't addressed, and I'm sure that the audience will let us know. Meanwhile, though, because I don't want them to forget about this, I'm going to put a little link up here in your upper left corner so that the audience can open up. This will open in a separate window, an evaluation for the session. Somebody asked a pre, I'll, I'll jump in here. Somebody asked a pre, um, a, a question earlier on before the session began about the best ways to initiate contact in developing an ongoing relationship. And I, I want to address that a little bit, and, and it stems a little bit from what we were just talking about, which is that don't waste their one, – one thing is, once you have it, don't waste their time. Because um, as we said, being inundated is, is a sure way to make them hit delete on everything you send not, um, and, and not give you the, the, um, the uh, time that you need to sell your story. But also, that's the negative part. The positive part is um, – making sure or trying to ensure that the story you give them is as exciting and interesting and, and has texture, not just facts, but has some you know, behind-the-scenes information or something that makes it a very rich story. If a, if a reporter um, knows that you've delivered for them in the past, they're going to be far more willing to uh, talk with you, sit down with you, figure out what makes a, a good story. That's a win-win for both of you. One thing that Judy said that I think is so important that I probably haven't emphasized enough today in my presentation is that you can feel free to consider a journalist a resource. Uh, again, you don't want to waste their time, but if you call someone, particularly an editor at a paper, and you find that a story doesn't work for them now or it's not quite right for their beat, you know, ask. Well, gee, is there someone else that you think uh, would be a better, be more appropriate for this? And you know, you, uh, you'll often find that that journalist will take a moment to help you. True, I think that's very true. I want to answer a technical question that I've gotten a couple of, and I'm going to pull this slide over top. We are recording these webinars, so after the event, you can co go back to this link, and eventually there will be a uh, link to the archive, to the recording, and also a copy of the slides. Several of you have asked for the slides. Um, so you know how to get to that information. Right. I'm seeing Kim Kenny talk about how when her local reporter comes, uh, she gives him copies of the text in the exhibit. All of that is so helpful. Absolutely. And it helps a journalist 
right with what Judy just called texture, which is gives them a real feel for why that story matters, not just about the objects in the exhibition, how old they are, but really um, the, the life of them. Okay, we're watching the. I yeah. also wanted to put up um, the, the reminder that the the two o'clock Eastern session is um, follow continuing this conversation dealing with social media specifically. And somebody caught that I may have had a typo in that link. I, you know, I have to look away from the screen in order to answer that question, and I don't want to do that right now. I'm hoping maybe Jonathan can post the correct link there, but. These will not be available instantaneously because we're going to turn our attention to setting up for the afternoon session and then get that stuff posted later. It takes a little bit of time to process this. So let's have more content questions come in as we have the last few minutes. Yeah, Troy Lambert has a good point. He says, yes, get to the point. You know, in a way, as a museum person, you're, we're, you know, you're a translator anyway. You know, you, it's about understanding the importance of the objects in your collections. But you're always kind of translating to the public, whether it be through tours or exhibition signage, why something matters. And it's certainly true when you talk to the media as well. So it's about getting to the point using real language, not, not um, any kind of jargon. Mm -hmm. Okay, great. I see somebody here who, um, I think it's Lynn Robertson, it's a, and it's saying, actually to her colleagues, but it says, you have to dedicate a specific time each week for doing publicity and stick to it. I can't agree more because I've been in a situation of working in a small museum where not only was I responsible for uh, publicity, but I was responsible for doing the newsletter, buying the advertising, doing the advertising um, copy. And I have to say, those things always seemed, in my experience, to take precedence over making those phone calls because... Um, you know, there are deadlines with the, news, uh, the newsletter, the director's, you know, breathing down your neck. So it's really, I think it's really important to devote a specific amount of time because publicity is a great thing to let drift. You can always wait till next week, you think, and then you realize that you've lost any, it's, you no longer have any time to promote something. And let's actually address, this hasn't come in, but let's address what happens if you fail to get the coverage that you want on the, on the, you know, your first try. You've, you've been working hard to get an exhibition covered or an archive covered or a conservation project covered. And what, um, what, uh, what do you do if you've failed? Um, I think you, and you, you may want to jump in, but I think you try to turn that into a relationship and not a failure. Yes, absolutely. If um, you really chose something that had news value and you went right to the point, as someone said earlier, and the, the journalist will, um, you know, respect your effort. And if you don't waste his or her time, I think then it's about using that. And, it's, you know, the next time you call, you can even say, uh, Ariel, you know, my name is Ann Edgar, and I talked to you a couple of months ago, and I really appreciated uh, the time you were able to give me. I called you then about this. I'm calling you now about. So you can even very quickly, a little more quickly maybe than I did just now, but remind them that you've spoken to them before and that they were helpful. Mm -hmm. And Michelle also asked a question about how do you um, make an annual event new each year? How do you send out the information on that? Gee whiz. Um, you know, um, I don't know that I have, maybe Judy has something. The only thing I would say is if you would work internally to try to always have some something different, something added, something a little bit different yeah, I, every what I year. Would, what I would say is that a journalist is kind of no different from your constituency. So what do you do for the people that you're trying to get back every year to make it new? That's what you would emphasize to the reporter. And, you know, sometimes an event will, an annual event, becomes part of the emotional um, or 
life you know, calendar of the people in your community. Like everyone looks forward to the uh, garden tour every May. So, you know, you you kind of work to create a, a niche in the life of the community where when you call about the annual garden tour, the journalist understands that it's important to run something because the journalist understands that uh, people in the community look forward to that annual event. Now let's get to Beth Sheffield's question. Is there a day of the week when it's easier to contact reporters? Um, Generally not, I would say. I mean, there are some people, if, if there's a columnist, right, certain days of the week, then you know um, not to talk to them necessarily the day before. But um, also if there's an art section only once a week, you might you might know not to call them the day before, but to call them earlier than that. But other than those situations, I would say no. Let's go back to what Anne said in her presentation. It's just better to try them in the morning than it is in the afternoon. And how Patrice asked about how about excuse me how about um, media or um, overkill? I'm sorry, I'm I'm thinking media events too. That's kind of my next question. Right. Yes, I think there is definitely something as overkill as a, as a, I think I mentioned there. You know, if you're hitting them with several emails a day, a week, or uh, you're just not uh, getting any resonance what resonance whatsoever with the messages that you send, but you keep sending them, I suspect, yeah. Reporters will become jaded, and they're not going to pay any attention to what you're offering. You know, in a way, too, uh, looking at some of the questions that were submitted before this um, webinar, in a way, they can be liberating for you because if you're the librarian and you're a one woman band or a one man band, you know, remember that you don't feel that you, you're losing anything because you're not contacting your local paper once a week. There's no recipe for the right amount of time to call. It should be driven by what's newsworthy. So that maybe that can relieve a little of your anxiety as well. Um, this question about getting people in hard topics, I would go back to something that we very, very br briefly touched on, um, and that is it doesn't necessarily have to be the arts or culture reporter that you go there. Maybe you can get somebody who's interested in another part of the section, the national section, somebody who's writing on um, science, somebody somebody outside the normal person you you might have a, a, a good luck there. Or just because it's hard, you know, I, I, I would just try to find an angle that appeals to the um, to the reporter that you're used to dealing with. Anne? Yeah, um, actually, I'm, I got distracted because I was looking at Robin. I'm sorry, I was looking at Robin oh. Van Alken's uh, input. Uh, Kiss of death to send a press release on a Friday. That's probably true. You know, <laughs> that's oh, probably I missed true. that one. Okay. Yeah, sorry, sorry. Actually, Friday uh, late afternoon. If you're, if it's something about the future, isn't not late. Afternoon. Well, that's you know, true. About like two o'clock yes. on a Friday afternoon is not a bad idea to to try to reach somebody uh, for something that's not tomorrow or, yeah, no. you know, because people do tend to be difficult to reach on Friday afternoons. And if the reporter doesn't have a deadline, uh, it, it might be a little bit of a, a quiet time where you might broach a, a, a topic that is going to take, or an exhibition or something that's going to take place six weeks, four weeks, whatever, down the line. I think maybe Friday afternoon might be a good idea to try a phone call or an email. Huh. I mean, it, it, yeah, you might reach someone on a Friday afternoon. For, for particularly that kind of one-on-one -on -one contact. Okay, well, I am going to suggest that maybe we wrap up here with some thank yous to Anne and Judith and to the, to the crowd that's here. What an inspired conversation this afternoon. Uh, we've gone all over the place but covered a huge amount of territory. And um, there's more to come this afternoon. There will still be, we'll be continuing much of the same, but with this emphasis on social media. And so I want to thank our guests today and invite the audience to take a break for an hour and then come back for the second part of our webinar, webinar series. So thank you both. And well, thank you, everybody, really. Thanks very much. From here, too, I learned a lot. And it's, I'm, I'm actually sorry some of these things were flying by so quickly because there's, um, it's very interesting for me, at least, to, to hear from, um, from the other, from, quote, unquote, the other side. Not that we're on sides, but from you know, your, learning your perspective was very, very interesting. All right, thank you. Thank you. Thanks.